Hello, I'm Edward October. Over the years, I've narrated more ghost stories, horror shows, and creepypastas than I can count. And yet, the crimes discussed on our true crime podcast managed to scare the shit out of me. This program is not suitable for children or the faint of heart. If you are such a person, go ahead and switch off this podcast. Listen to something else. Are you still with us? Well, we've warned you. Hi, Jen. Hey, Cam. How are you? I'm fad tobulous. How about nice. you? Nice. Well, I like how you make up words. And you I just do. make them your own. That's awesome. I do. I do. Yeah. Well, it's very, awesome. It's very shashashis. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Oh, that's a good word. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Here you got a case for us today. The I people do. Out there. I do. This Do case, I know this case by any chance? You may. You okay. may. I know I was a guest on our friend Jules' podcast, the mm. um, Riddle Me That podcast, and Riddle we covered this story. Okay. And uh, I decided I wanted to do it here because it's, I think you'll like it. Okay, I'm ready. Or not um, like it, but it's interesting. It's very interesting. I, I, I know what you meant. And we're meant. going to Bangladesh, which we've oh, never oh, oh. gone okay. to that part of the world before. No, right? we have not. No. No. Mm-mm. So Mm-mm. I just thought it would be interesting to throw that in. And since we are going to the side of the world, that we've never been before, you can guarantee that I probably will not be pronouncing <laughs> names or anything properly. Uh, but I promise you, I've tried my best and I've looked, pronouncednames.com should, you know, Jim, give us a cut of the pie. That's that's part of your charm, though. Come on. I now. know. And I've tried so hard. And if you'd seen my scripts, charm. you'll know. Let's, let's be honest. Everything is phonically spelled out on the script for you. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. let's hope I do it well. So are you ready? I'm so ready. In late 2015, a breathtaking image of a Maldivian girl went viral. The photographer, Shifaz Havi, could not have known that the photograph on the internet would set in motion a series of events that would eventually lead to tragedy. The photograph was of 19-year-old Rauda Atif, wearing a snow-white sleeveless dress, standing chest-high, cerulean tea, swirl of Indian Ocean. And while the image is perfectly composed and lit with Rauda staring straight at the camera with a Mona Lisa type smile, the true perfection of that image is Rauda herself. With her black hair and dark skin glistening from the ocean water, the spectator is at once mesmerized by Rauda's radiantly aqua colored eyes. It wouldn't take long before the image snagged the attention of Vogue magazine. And unfortunately, it wouldn't take long before Rauda was dead. Now, if you see, her eyes are amazing. Just looking it up right now. Boy, is she gorgeous. Holy it moly. Drop dead. I normally don't like to comment on anybody's looks or anything, but she was gorgeous. And her eyes, there's something about them. Like the... Pretty is what they're the, called. The irises, the ring around the iris is ever so dark. But then inside of the iris is almost like a gray blue gray, color i mean like, yeah they're gorgeous and th- they are mesmerizing i mean yes, just they are. beautiful the island nation of the maldives is located in the indian ocean about halfway between the arabian and the lacadive seas about 500 miles southwest of sri lanka it's a country made up of 1192 different islands grouped together in 27 atolls and an atoll is a ring-shaped coral reef island. The Maldives is a vacationer's paradise with alabaster sandy beaches, underwater hotels, overwater bungalows, and an average temperature of about 83 degrees year-round. Seriously, mm-hmm. it does sound like paradise. Mm-hmm. It's incredibly remote with no direct flights from most countries. And like Venice, Italy, it is also in dire threat from rising ocean levels. And some estimate that the island nation will no longer exist within 30 years and all of its residents will become climate refugees. Aww. So we better go visit there. Yeah, I was just <laughs> thinking that. Man. Better go see it before it's gone. 
makes my heart hurt for that. In 2008, Rauda and her family moved to Bhopal, India, one of India's greenest cities. Now, back in 1984, a massive chemical leak from a pesticide factory left Bhopal's soil and water toxic and killed nearly 4,000 people. As a result, the city has made a determined effort to avoid similar catastrophes in the future and incorporate other environmentally friendly policies, now, including to try and eliminate fossil fuels used within the city. Like so many young people belonging to Generation Z, Rauda, who was born in 1996, began to think outside the box in hopes of finding alternatives to environmental issues. It's possible that the time spent in Bhopal and the possible future destruction of her home islands helped to magnify the need for environmental change in Rauda's mind. So in 2010, 14-year-old Rauda Atif took part in a small environmental campaign for the Maldivian National Television Network, encouraging people to ban plastic bags in favor of eco-friendly alternatives. It was clear early on that Rauda wasn't just a pretty face. Her lifelong dream was to become a doctor to help people. She worked as a clinical assistant in India at a military hospital and the Indira Gandhi Memorial Hospital. When she graduated from Hiriya School in the Maldivian capital, she received a scholarship to attend Islami Bank Medical College in Rashahi, Bangladesh. It was her plan that after graduating from IBMC, that she would pursue the rest of her academic career in Australia, where some of her family lived. Now, Bangladesh was a culture shock for Rauda. And even though Rauda and her family were Muslims, Rauda's family are more moderate in their beliefs than what she would encounter in Bangladesh. Her new college required that all female students abide by a specific dress code. So Rauda went ahead and she bought a new conservative wardrobe. And she purchased the shalas, which are the long scarves that wrap around the head, and the hijabs, which cover the neck and the head. Bangladesh, known as the Land of Six Seasons, is located in southern Asia and is home to the largest river delta in the world. The Brahmaputra River and the Ganges River converge in dozens of tributaries and deposits into the Bay of Bengal. Floating guava markets on the canals that crisscross thousands of guava orchards come alive during monsoon season. The Sundarbans are one of the largest mangrove forests in the world and home to thousands of species and trees and animals, including the royal Bengal tiger. Bangladesh is one of the most densely populated countries in the world and has only been in existence in its current incarnation since 1971. Before that, it was known as East Pakistan. Bangladesh was under military rule for 15 years, and democracy was restored in 1990. And even though extremist groups are on the rise, the government tries hard to maintain control. Poverty is widespread, but in recent years, the country has reduced population growth and made some improvements in health and education. But one thing about Rauda was that she wasn't afraid of change. She welcomed adventure, and with thoughts of all the good she wanted to contribute to the world, she excitedly headed to Bangladesh. Rauda settled into dorm life in room 209 on the second floor of her dorm, and she made friends easily. It, the dorm is kind of like a hostel, mostly, or they called it like a hostel kind of thing. Her Instagram account showed many outings with fellow students, one of which was her best friend, Sarit Parveen Mohammed. Rauda began dating a man called Shahi Ghani, but focused always remained on being a doctor. In 2016, during her second year of medical school, the editors of Vogue magazine reached out to Rada to ask her to participate in a photo shoot. Rada would take her place on the anniversary cover and five other models from the region in and around India. Editor, editor Shuri Gupta described Rauda as warm and kind-hearted. She also said that tracking her down had been a challenge. Rauda made many trips back and forth between her home in the Maldives to school in Bangladesh, which only made it that much harder for Gupta to find her. Gupta and Rauda finally did connect, however, through Facebook. Rauda happened to be in the middle of exams at the time, and she wasn't really willing to let anything get in her way of achieving her childhood dream of becoming a doctor. And she was willing to forego the Vogue cover if the dates clashed with her exams, right? Because modeling was just a hobby for her. Rauda ended up being ecstatic with the whole experience and also with the beautiful results that the Vogue team worked so hard to achieve. And she was also very excited about being part of a cover of a magazine as famous and respected as Vogue. 
which celebrated models with unconventional beauty. Well, unconventional by Western standards. She told Vogue India, quote, I've never been so bold as to take part of any big pageant before this. However, when the issues hit the stand in October of 2016, the happiness Rauda felt soon gave way to concern. The students at the school began to treat her differently. She received threats and insults for not dressing in a manner appropriate for a Muslim girl. Other than the fact that she continued to wear jeans occasionally on campus, Rauda always adhered to the dress code while at school. But modeling in general is looked down upon in some of the more extreme factions of Islam. And to have her depicted in the magazine with exposed arms, shoulders, and hair made matters even worse. Mm. In 2017, Rauda discovered that her boyfriend, Shahi, had cheated on her, and she broke up with him. And shortly thereafter, just one week before her death, Rauda expressed to her mother that she thought her roommate and best friend, Sarit Parveen, had tried to poison her. She suspected that there was either some sort of poison or some kind of sedative, or maybe both, had been administered to her by way of juice or tea. Really? That's, yeah. Kind of scary, huh? Very scary. On March 29th, 2017, Sarit Parveen, who lived in a room next to Rauda, claimed she went to Rauda's dorm room and found the door locked. However, she was able to see inside the dorm room through a crack in the door. Now, the doors were like a double door, like they both, op- you know what I'm saying? Double door. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And there was like a huge crack down the middle of the two double doors. So she looked through this crack and saw Rauda, a thief, hanging from the ceiling fan with a scarf. Sarit began screaming, and soon she was surrounded by other female students and their dorm manager. Sarit later told the police that they had busted the door in, removed Rauda's lifeless body from the ceiling fan, and laid her on the bed. When the authorities arrived, the room had been trampled over by dozens of people. Like, people kept walking in and out, ruining the crime scene. Pictures of Rauda's dead body soon made her w- their way onto the internet. And in one photo, there's a package of rat poisoning that can be seen lying next to her on the bed. Authorities removed her body from the dorm room, took her next door to the adjacent hospital, and performed an autopsy without her family's permission. And according to the family, there were no radiological tests, no CT scans, x-rays, DNA tests, nothing. No kinds of tests were performed on her. And with hours, the coroner determined that Rauda had completed suicide. Huh. When Rauda's father, Dr. Mohammed Atif, who is a physician in pediatric critical care, a health advocate, an AMU alumni, and a supporter of Amnesty International, arrived in Bangladesh, he was informed of his daughter's suicide. Now, he wouldn't accept this, and considering how devoted Rauda was To positively impacting the world, he could not believe she would even, those thoughts would even come through her head. When he went to his daughter's room, he was immediately struck by several things that went against the official report. One was the fact that the door that Sarit and the other girls supposedly busted in to get to Rauda was not damaged in any way. There were no cracks or splinters in the wood, and the locks were undamaged. And These locks are the type of locks that slid upward. I think they're called slide bolt latch locks, right? Mm -hmm. And they were pretty heavy duty. And if they had to bust the door down, those doors would be splinters. I mean, the framing would have been gone. The bolts would have been bent or something. Mm -hmm. Later, Dr. Atif would also claim that nobody in the dorm would admit to removing his daughter's body from the ceiling fan. All the witnesses, aside from Surat, claimed that Rauda was already on the bed when they arrived. The second thing that Dr. Atif noticed was that Rauda had been in the middle of cooking a curry for lunch, and she had made herself a cup of tea. Now, the curry pan was still on the stove, or like the little hot plate that they use. Uh All the ingredients were still on the cutting board. There was a bottle of curry spices that had rolled under the bed. Now, I would. she was in the middle of making lunch. Mm-hmm. And I don't think most people do Would that and then go off and, and just themselves. in the middle of it, right. yeah, kill themselves. What? Um, it also appeared as though there'd been some kind of struggle in the room. Like I said, the curry spice had rolled under the bed. There was a glass table that the top was broken. Chairs were overturned. A mirror was cracked and barely 
was hanging on to the wardrobe. Dr. Atif said that Rauda had always been a tidy person and very well organized, so the condition of her room made him think that there was some kind of struggle. Mm-hmm. What I'm thinking. And the thing that seemed the most unbelievable to Dr. Atif was the condition of the ceiling fan. It was a pretty small fan, and it was pretty flimsy in construction, mm-hmm. and it was in perfect condition. So, yeah, it would have fallen down. Rauda weighed about 122 pounds, which is around 55 kilograms. And not only did her weight not damage the fan, but there was no cracks in the drywall or the plaster on the ceiling. Mm-hmm. And it was pretty high up and she couldn't have reached it. And there was no chair or ladder. I mm-hmm. mean, how did she get up there? Mm-hmm. And also there was no suicide note. Officials are saying that in the middle of lunch, she decided to somehow kill her, hang herself from the fan, magically yeah. going up there mm-hmm. and not leave a note. Mm-mm. I don't believe it. But the condition of Rauda's body most concerned her father. Not only was there no saliva around her mouth, which supposedly happens during hangings. I think it happens in like 33% of all hangings. The ligature marks from this quote unquote scarf, they looked more like a belt with a buckle or something similar. Like it left a mark on her? Right. Like the ligature marks around her neck where the scarf mm-hmm. was supposed to be. Mm-hmm. It didn't look like it was from a scarf. There was actually hard markings. And there are pictures on the internet that you can find and look. And yeah. like even me as a lay person that knows absolutely nothing, I could say, yeah, that looks like it was a belt. It doesn't look like a smart scarf. scarf. So like I said, the lines of the mark were very sharp, not anything you would expect from a piece of cloth. And you can, like I said, you can find pictures online. There was also a two inch contusion on her chin and very clear bruising around her neck. Now, the bruising was so clear that the impressions of four fingers on one side and a thumb on the other could be determined. Like you can see that somebody held her by the neck. Uh Dr. Atif thought he was looking at the perfect imprint of somebody's hand around his daughter's throat. Now, remember, he's a forensic doctor. Uh Dr. Atif knows his stuff. Dr. Atif questioned the results of the autopsy, and when he inquired about the handprint around his daughter's neck, the coroner first told him that he thought Rauda had changed her mind during the suicide and that the bruises were caused by her own hands tugging at the scarf. Uh Then, at one point, somebody suggested that the bruising was caused by the small beads that decorated the scarf she used to hang herself with. Independent forensic research from Australia has debunked both explanations by examining Rauda's body's photographs. And according to them, the markings on her neck just don't match the scarf. Uh And finally, this one is laughable. They told Dr. Atif that the marks on Rauda's neck were birthmarks. Oh, okay. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Not only did Dr. Atif find the statement to be insulting to the science of forensics, but to himself as well. As a father who knows your child. Exactly. The authorities were basically stating that in the 21 years he had known Rauda, he hadn't noticed a birthmark on his daughter's neck. Not to mention, it's called a birthmark because you have it mm -hmm. at birth, and so little baby girl would have it. Parents would know that. And quote, it can't be a birthmark if it takes 21 years to appear. Dr. Atif said in an interview with 60 Minutes Australia, and not to mention, Rauda was a model, and the whole world has seen her photographs that include her neck. Mm -hmm. Dr. Atif has said, quote, I am certain my daughter was murdered. There were fingerprints around her neck. And from the looks of these prints, Rauda was choked to death by a right-handed person. Mm -hmm. If she had committed suicide, then why was her body taken down before the police arrived? This is murder. Uh-huh. I agree. Mm-hmm. Now, to make things a bit more interesting, the 24-7 CCTV camera outside Rauda's room just happened to malfunction on the night Rauda died. Now, these cameras worked during the day, and 
Yeah, just working properly throughout the day. There's footage of Rauda going into the hostel or her dorm, and there's footage of every other day, but nothing else. It goes, Hmm. the time she was, this happened, nothing. There's no film. Right. Mm -hmm. Very Jeffrey Epstein, if you get what I'm saying. Very uh, questionable, to say the least. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Within days of Rauda's death, there was activity on her Instagram account, and she was unfollowed by two people. One of them was her best friend, Surratt. Surratt was also the same person who discovered Rada's body, remember, and the last person to see her alive. Mm -hmm. The other person she unfollowed was a man identified on Instagram as motion underscore zero zero five. A few days later, I don't know, motion underscore zero zero five. Yeah. A few days later, Rada's entire Instagram account was deleted. None of this online activity was done by any of Rada's family. And Dr. Atif has publicly stated That Rauda could not have deleted her social media account from beyond the grave. And he's not wrong, right? No. Yeah. In his mind, this clearly points to another person's involvement. Uh Mm-hmm. Who would have your password numbers to that, Cam? Your your boyfriend and your best friend, probably. Mm Mm-hmm. Most likely. So armed with all that evidence and contradictory information, Dr. Atif filed a civil complaint with the chief magistrate in the magistrate's court in which he accused Sarit Parveen of murdering his daughter, Rauda. And he also requested that the court order the police to reinvestigate Rauda's death. And so the magistrate ordered a criminal investigation. The local police were replaced by Bangladesh CID, which is Criminal Investigation Department. They exhumed Rauda's body and performed an additional autopsy. They concluded that Rauda completed suicide. Mm Mm-mm. No. Not happy. Mm-hmm. Not happy with the findings of the CID. Doctor Atif was able to get another investigation off the ground. This one was performed by the Police Bureau of Investigation, which started on August eighteenth, two thousand eighteen, following a court order. They too announced that quote the model Rauda had completed suicide and that no sign of a homicide was found. Pretty mm. weird, right? Mm-mm. Not a cover up. While Rauda did not leave behind a suicide note, the authorities turned to the text messages that Rauda sent her boyfriend, Shahi. When she broke up with him, they claimed that Rauda had, quote, given in to her despair and completed suicide over the breakup with her boyfriend, Uh -uh. according to the investigating officer. The last received call on the mobile phone was from her boyfriend, Shahi Ghani. On the 28th, the day before her death, her last text message to her boyfriend said, quote, I only loved you. You never loved me. You're a terrible human being. You've done irreparable damage. You killed me. I feel dead. There's nothing left in me. Incidentally, she had gone to the hospital earlier that day, feeling as though she had been drugged. Rauda's father has quite a bit to say about the findings of the investigation and reasons the PBI thought Rauda had completed suicide. On his Twitter account, Dr. Atif stated, quote, The initial report was prepared by a team of three doctors. Two of them belong to the Islami Bank Medical College. The college has done a lot to stage her death as suicide. Nobody has seen her hanging, aside from Surat, and the ligature mark on her neck does not match with the scarf. He claimed that the PCCID did not even visit the crime scene, which, after this happened, somehow Dr. Atif got Rauda's room to stay exactly the way it was found for like seven months. So all this investigation could be done. Dr. Atif went on to say, quote, Rauda has no reason to commit suicide for a boyfriend. Shahi was not her first boyfriend. She would not kill herself for a guy whom she met for a couple of months and in a distant relationship. She never told anyone she would commit suicide. She didn't leave a suicide note. She never told anyone she would commit suicide and didn't leave a suicide note. Even in the message she sent Shahi, she didn't say she would kill herself. She called her friend in Malaysia that night around 10.30 Bangladesh time and told her also she should come to Malé, which is the capital of the Maldives, next month for vacation. So she had planned that she would go back for vacation. Mm -hmm. Indeed, the fact that Rauda vocalized concern to her mother that somebody at the college was trying to poison her, you would think that it would lead one to believe that Rauda was not suicidal, but in fact, very worried about staying alive. Mm Mm-hmm. So why does Dr. Atif believe his daughter was murdered? 
And why does he think that Islami Bank Medical College is covering it up? Dr. Atif believes that if a Vogue cover model was murdered at IBMC, it would make the college and Bangladesh in general look bad. Yeah, I'd say they so. Also, mm-hmm, so they engaged in a cover up, passing her death off as a suicide as quickly as they could. I mean, look at the colleges here in the States that cover up like mm-hmm. hazing incidences and rapes and mm-hmm. all that sort of stuff. Yes. As to why someone would went routed dead in the first place, that's a little bit more complicated. One of the theories is that Surat Parveen was jealous of Rauda, and indeed, she would have good reason to be. I mean, Rauda was not only gorgeous, but she was smart. She came from a loving family, and she seemed to have it all, including a future full of possibilities that Surat would never have. However, Rauda's brother... Rayon believes Islamic extremists kill his sister because she was not behaving properly for a Muslim girl. I don't know. I'm going more with the friend. According to 60 Minutes Australia, the IBMC is known to have connections to Muslim extremist groups. Just one week before Rauda's death, police raided the college and arrested 29 males involved in extremist activities. It's theorized that her Vogue photo shoot could have enraged the extremist Mm. groups. That's true. Some members of the Atif family believe that she was murdered to teach a lesson to her and all the other females at the college, too. This particular theory might seem outlandish, but the Atifs quickly pointed out that two other female models have completed suicide in Bangladesh in recent years under dubious circumstances. Hmm. As for now, both theories, a jealous best friend or a religious extremist group, are exactly that, just theories. But for Dr. Atif, it doesn't really matter why she was killed because she's still gone. He can never get her back and this could never be undone. What he wants is justice and for the truth to come out. It's difficult to ignore the sheer unimaginative thinking of the Bangladeshi investigators. If nobody in Rauda's family deleted her Instagram account and nobody in her family unfriended two of her followers, then somebody clearly had access to Rauda's computer or phone. And while iPhones are password protective, you know, and we talked, Mm -hmm. we just said this earlier, it's no stretch of the imagination to think whoever killed her could have access to these passwords. Mm -hmm. If the person who deleted her Instagram account is the same person who killed her, they could have easily sent the desperate text messages to Rauda's ex-boyfriend. If this is true, it also shows the lack of imagination on her killer's part to blame all the problems of an intelligent, independent woman and her eventual suicide on a broken heart is the biggest insult to Rauda of it all. Bangladesh has played their side in all of this the right way. No one can claim that they didn't investigate Rauda's murder. In fact, they've checked all the boxes necessary to appease the casual onlooker, including performing two autopsies. There have been between three and five official investigations of Rauda's death. By making sure to take this case seriously, at least outwardly, Dr. Atif cannot claim that the authorities or the government have ignored him or the death of his daughter. And it's very clear that the authorities don't want negative publicity for the school or the country at large. Now, interestingly, when 60 Minutes Australia was in Bangladesh covering the story, an incident occurred which would make even the most casual conspiratist take notice. The 60 Minutes team was filming in Rauda's dorm room when the journalist turned to the police and said, quote, what if the autopsy report was wrong? Police officer answered him quickly, saying something like, "Uh, then our investigation will discover that and then backed away. Shortly after that moment, the journalists were told it wasn't safe for them to be there and that they needed more security. They were told to stop filming and not just in the college, but they were instructed not to film in the town, the whole town of Rashid. Yeah, Rashahi itself. They had to stop filming completely. And in a move that probably gave the journalists a pause for deep concern, they had their passports taken from them, and they were told that they couldn't leave the hotel for the remainder of their trip. So basically, they were put under house arrest. Uh, wow. Huh. Yeah. Well, uh, I have two thoughts on that. The extremist, if it's the extremist, they reached out and said, listen, we're going to kill these people and it's going to make worldwide news. Take care of it. Or what are we going to do about these meddling kids, basically, is what you're saying, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when traveling to places of unrest, most foreign journalists have a journalist or a liaison in that country who knows the language and the customs fairly well to escort them and to show them around. 
The journalist on the ground helping the 60 Minutes team was a man named Ron Arshad. After the team's passports were taken, Ron was summoned to see a high-ranking member of the Bangladesh Intelligence Service. Ron, who was the experienced journalist and he's worked in the region for a while, was so worried about the sudden turn and his summons to the intelligence Mm -hmm. services Mm -hmm. that he called his wife beforehand to tell her where he was going in case he never returned. Quote, in such instances as these, he said, people are known to vanish. Is he okay? Yeah. Uh, They're not going to get rid of him all of a sudden. He's with 60. I mean, it's not like he had another country involved at this point, right? Right. Extra police were then called to guard the hotel they were staying in. And after 24 hours under house arrest, the Australian journalists were given a police escort to the airport where they were allowed to leave. Luckily, they had already filmed everything that they needed for their segment on Rauda's death. I'm going to Google this later and watch it. Oh, it's, it's good. It's on YouTube. Okay. The link is in my notes. Okay. Show notes. The journalist, who, the one who wrote the article about putting put under house arrest, didn't say whether they were treated this way out of suspicion that they would write a negative segment about the Rashahi or the college or Bangladesh or if they were just being treated in such a manner because the police officers suddenly realized that the journalists were genuinely under threat and wanted to protect them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it goes both ways. That's what I was thinking, mm-hmm. you know. Rauda Atif was buried in Bangladesh, far away from any of her family and friends. Her father says that he will stay there until he gets justice for his daughter. One can't help but feel sorry for Dr. Atif and the rest of Rauda's family because there aren't too many avenues left for him to follow regarding mm-hmm. his daughter's death. Very few people ever accept that their loved ones, especially their child, can kill themselves. Right. And unless you've had a conversation with your loved one where they actually state that they're suicidal, almost everybody's first response to hearing this type of news is denial. No way, not my husband, not my daughter, child, sister, or best friend. In the end, we are all left with this resounding sense of loss on a humanitarian level. Rauda, as a doctor, could have gone on to help so many people. And Rauda, the model, could have brought much-needed attention to the causes that she cared about and championed for. Instead, there is a gaping hole where she should be. And for a brief, shining moment, Rauda mesmerized the world far more than any of her contemporaries ever will. Hmm. So That's awful. Yeah. See, I know that happens everywhere, but at least at least it's <sighs> it's pretty shady. I mean, it's, here's the yeah. deal. If s- her best friend was the one to kill Rauda, let's mm-hmm. say, murder her, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. she either didn't put Rauda on the fan or she had help. Right? She mm-hmm. might have put Rauda on the bed and strangled her with the belt there. It's obviously a belt. There's no way. If it was a on that 60 Minutes episode, the forensic guy even said that if it was a cloth, that you wouldn't have had such straight lines on the mm-hmm. neck. It would have been a softer bruise, right? right. But this right. is obviously something like a half-inch leather, sturdy something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I it's... I'm going to say, I'm going to guess she probably... She wasn't even up on that fan. I bet you she was I never up there. Don't know. I mean, I guess there was no toxicology report done. And the way that everything's treated, I'm almost thinking that it's the extremists. Well, that's, I'm, that's what I'm kind of, well, rushing them out of there. It wouldn't be any skin off their back if it was her best friend or even her boyfriend. You know what I right. mean? I mean, it would look poorly on the college, you know, but, but you it wouldn't. Yeah, but you make can't help that. You know what I mean? That. Right. You have a murderer in your midst. Yeah. You, yeah. You and her it. best friend could be a part of the extremist group, too. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe Man. this Mosin underscore zero zero five was part of it. I don't. It, it's just weird. And that, that I guess it's to teach women the lesson to behave. Is that what and the, they were to saying? To cover up. Right. Because yeah. it's the Muslim. Yeah. They're a religious, an extremist religious group. Mm-hmm. And they want women to know their place, I guess, and put. No body parts should be, it's modesty, right? Cover your hair, cover your yeah. body. I mean, I don't know much about the Muslim religion, so I can't really speak on it. Yeah. But that's, to me, that's what it sounds like is probably. More so than the friend. More so than the friend. I think the friend was the first thing. I mean, she could still be a, a suspect, but yeah. I think she might have played a part in it. Mm-hmm. But I do believe it boils down to the extremist. The Muslim group. Um, 
uh, talk about attention because it did get so much attention because of her. You know what I right. mean? Like mm-hmm. What she did and stuff. Yeah. But it's a very sad, sad it's all the way. I mean, think about that. Definitely Ugh. suggest watching that on YouTube, the 60 Minutes Australia on oh, her. I'm going it'll be to. on the show. It'll be on the show notes. They also have the photographs of Rauta's body lying on the bed and her neck. So be careful when you watch it. I could see um, that, like, if, if if I walked in and it was my loved one up there, I could see that I would, I mean, I'm trying to put myself in that spot. I could see that I would freak out and you would take them down because you're like, maybe there's a second mm-hmm. that they're still breathing. Maybe they're okay. I think that's very common to but, try to do. Mm-hmm, but also, I don't, I, I think at that young age, I think you might just scream, you know, like, oh my God. But nobody but Surat even said that she was hanging, right? I mean... They all said that she was lying on the bed when they got there. Right. Her friend is the only one that claimed that everybody rushed in. But then again, the door's not broken either. There's pictures of the door that looks in perfect condition. So would, would that indicate that she knew she let somebody in? I would think so. Yeah. And like there was no chairs but or you know, ladders been, for you, the Rada to get up on the fan. If the extremists are going to that school, they hide in plain sight and they could be friends, too. You know what I mean? They could have been mm-hmm. friends with her. And so she's like, oh, there they are. When all that time they're just conniving to, you know, to get their point across, I guess. And I mean, she did wear jeans and I don't think jeans were, I, I could be wrong, but I don't think jeans are acceptable as the dress. Mm-hmm. But she did always wear the hijab and the scarf. So she followed the rules she, when she was supposed to. She I think just was so, also yeah. a, a kid and wanted to just... And she was a model. On 60 Minutes, they also they interviewed another model who has said that she has received death threats. Oh, wow. Because because they show off their job. Yeah, they show off their body. And it's not a considered a something a woman should do in that culture. So, I don't know. It's interesting. It's sad. So she could have changed the world. She could have have. become a doctor and you know, she could have helped cure. save Maldives and not to not go be sink, sinking underwater. I who knows? Her future mm-hmm. was very bright. Terrible, absolutely not good. Mm-hmm. And thank goodness and we live, you know, where we do. I guess. Yeah, yeah. and if you look everything up, um, her brother Rayon has done lots of interviews on where he's about his claims. I didn't want to include them there because they're from. Newspapers like The Sun, which I believe are kind of like the National Enquirer of mm-hmm. our time. So I the didn't want to recruit them here. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you all feel free to look them up and read them. But I don't like to include references to that kind of stuff because mm-hmm. they're mm-hmm. they're not reputable. And we're Get trying it. to be. Darn it. Well, and again, I just want to a big I can hear America. Uh, well, correct. <laughs> I can hear the world clapping right now at how you tr- oh. did so well with those words. No, thanks. It was. Uh, yeah, it was a lot. It was something. <laughs> also, I want to add real quick that if you're thinking about suicide and you're in the United States, you call or text 988. If you're thinking about it, if you have if you're worried about a friend or loved one or you just need emotional support, call 988. It's the Lifeline Network. It's available 24-7 across the United States. In the UK, you can call Samaritans, their 24-7 hotline at 116-123. And in Australia, you can call Lifeline's 24-7 hotline at 13 or 131114. All the other ones, I there's too many to list, but... Just get help. Just get help. Call someone. Reach out. Don't oh, that keep was it a to good yourself. Job, Jen, Jen. Make sure that you watch the YouTube oh, on I'm her. To. To it's very that. interesting. She's so pretty. Yes. Can't look away. So, right. And I want to apologize for my voice. I'm kind of fighting off allergies and everything. So there's that. I didn't anyway. notice anything. Mm, I did. You sound the same to me. Yeah, sure. All right. That's all, all right. I've got. That's a good job, Jen. And uh, until next time, remember, lock your doors. And keep passing by those open windows. Uh, Bye-bye. Love ya. For more information about this episode, as well as all other sources, please check out our show notes or the podcast website at OurTrueCrimePodcast.com. Our True Crime Podcast is developed and created by the hosts, Jen and Cam. 
Original music and audio mix of all our True Crime podcast episodes is courtesy of Nico Vertese from We Talk of Dreams. You can reach Nico at wetalkofdreams.com. Listener discretion is provided by Edward October from October Pod VHS. You can find all of his great works on YouTube. Please make sure to like and subscribe to our True Crime podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. We can be reached on Instagram and Facebook at Our True Crime Podcast or on Twitter with the handle at Our True Crime Pod. You can also email us at Our True Crime Podcast at gmail.com. We would also at this time like to thank our patrons. We would be so lost without you. Thank you so much. And if you would like to help support the show, you can check us out on patreon.com slash Our True Crime Podcast. You can also show your support by leaving a five-star review on Apple or simply just tell your friends about us. It's that easy. Love ya.